when you know when NT when 2K win 98. You go ahead and give everybody a little background because there's a lot of similarities in some of the registry-based things and the same methods of attack. So let's start off with the old stuff. My favorite and common attacks in Windows are what we call keying. You have somebody who leaves an open share, you get write access to, read access to a drive. When you read the drive, all you need is a user and system dat file. You can use a program on my web page called RegWaver to turn that into a .reg file. From there, let's say your victim has Netscape mail. How many of you use it? They've given you a cast password because you said, sure enough, clicked on remember my password. So most people think, you know, let's try to crack it. Let's go ahead and disassemble it, try to break the encryption. That's like peeing up a rope. It's real simple. You export the key. You then copy the key over to your box, put it in safe preferences, set up a fake mail server, mount it across, snake the packet. Your authentication will be in clear text. Same thing with online accounts, Juno, private VPNs. All of it is cached in Windows 2000 as well. All you need is read access to the registry. I'm going to move right along to shares. Give me a brief overview. We have file print and sharing. A lot of people still leave it enabled. The biggest myth in NT and 2K security, people think because they remove net buoy that they're not vulnerable. They don't understand there's what we have called the net BIOS helper. Is it, when you have a little blue hands in a nutshell, you're sharing, no matter what protocols you think you may or may not have installed. And I'd say the most common problem with Windows is the fact that people don't know how to secure these. They don't know how to password a share. And especially within T, people have moved more and more away from a secure domain model and using things like file and print servers. You know, mostly you go into a consulting gig or you show up at your company, you click that thing, you got a whole bunch of people in the network neighborhood, no sorting, no order. Half of them sharing their MP3s or their entire C drives giving you, as I previously mentioned, uh, read access to everything. I call this the come sodomize me attitude towards security. <laughs> now, people think, even when their password is, it's still not that secure. The only way to really securely use sharing, because let's face it, you go to your IT folks, you say, turn sharing the bloody hell off. So we're just going to break Outlook and everything else. We, want to have, we don't want to have to work and make a secure domain model. We just want a mesh where everybody can sort of grab what they want. I love that attitude. It's great. I have fun grabbing what I want from their networks as well. <laughs> but uh, what it comes down to is on the securing side, you need to make sure there is one machine sharing. That would be your file server. Outlook's not going to break if you make people use a secure bloody system. People have gotten way too used to the Microsoft mesh. They don't remember, you know, a lot of the original A plus certs. People look, you know, when they're going through their network training, all the new IT guys these days, they're not looking for what's a secure domain model. They see token ring, they see the topology. Well, what they're looking for is, hey, what's going to pass this test? Give me this cert and give me a nice pan job. Therefore, a lot. Of, therefore, you get a lot of idiots going through. Oh, I got, a, you know, free shares. And the networks aren't really secure, and people going Windows isn't secure. Okay, yeah, granted, all Windows boxes are about as secure as a plus sizes model. But when you set them up, <laughs> when you set up correctly, they can be really highly effective. Then we have the same problem with shares. We have people who put up a firewall. And they think, okay, I can put up a firewall in front of my Win2K box, block 135 through 139, which are as well in the NetBIOS and NetBuoy ports and nobody's going to be able to get my information. Oops. Most of what you, all you have to do, let's say for instance, you have somebody who's got the nice fancy PICS, which is a very nice secure firewall. They've blocked off everything and they haven't turned off and they have all these machines sharing. You do an NBT stat. The request goes through 80. And when it, when it replies, it, uh, that buoy will piggyback over TCP IP and send you the table statted right out. The way to obviously fix this, or you have the same problem, people will turn off any incoming, 139, 135, 137. Somebody sends in the request. It'll, you know, NetBuoy makes an easy and very secure route for itself. It makes that route any way it can. So once you've mapped a share or the IPC dollar sign, 
it's going to send its request. Are you sending any MBT request to sending broadcasting? It's going to it's going to piggyback out and send its request over 80. So you got your MBT table showing a list of shares, work groups. If you want them enumerated users, local logon accounts, landman hashes, what have you. And the point the fire firewall is pretty well useless. Next, I'm going to go ahead and move into software updates, update technology. One of the biggest problems you have is somebody slapping 2K over an old NT box. <laughs> Best way to do it is format the box and install it fresh. Because if you if you install 2K over old NT, you're managing to, managing to take all the beautiful, creative, innovative disasters that are NT 4.0 and combine them with the instability and lack of support for 2K. And it's a beautiful combination if you happen to be working in Redmond, but otherwise it doesn't work down here. And to go ahead and bounce back to sharing, uh, when, it, when 2K was first released, they had a wonderful, horrendous bug. You could have admin rights. You know, you could use map the admin shares if you were an unauthenticated member of the domain because you could map C dollar sign across the network until they went ahead and patched that in the pre-releases. But their net buoy is just as messy. There are other options you can go into and send the protocol, trusted IPs and such. That would be the best place to lock it down. Personally, I think that nobody should have that on their server. It should be one file server. You see, so one company put out a really secure way of transferring files in your office. I think they call it FTP. <laughs> You know, there is no reason or excuse for a mesh network. Next, I want to go ahead and move into some of the semi-new creative bugs that they managed to carry over from good old NT. And combined with the wonderful great new features of Windows, let's say, for instance, I'm sure a lot of you heard about the Microsoft Outlook vulnerabilities, which allows you to write over, overwrite local files. Well, a buddy of mine recently remind, reminded me of the NT exploit where you take any executable file, any .exe, or any DLL or binary file that has executable stream in it. You go ahead and rename it logon.scr. You then one use, then use one of our beautiful new write outlook vulnerabilities to write that to the system32 directory. So this works great on servers too. Logon.scr is a little bouncing screen when you don't hit control alt and delete when you log in or you have it sitting there. But sure enough, it executes when that when your code executes. If you can't write a decent Trojan that doesn't show anything, well, you still got the wonderful thing that by definition, the one time it's going to execute is when they're not at the computer. <laughs> Personally, I think Outlook should not be left on a 2K system. You can see a lot of people trying to stay on the bleeding edge of technology and deploy 2K before it's been thoroughly tested. And once again, cutting cost corners. I cannot stress this enough. Never install 2K over 4.0. Also one of the newest creative disasters. I'm sure you all have heard of Windows Millennium, the new upgrade to 98 that's coming out. I use upgrade in the loosest possible sense of the term. Well, they ha Windows 2K is using a lot of the same bastardized Ac ActiveX things and controls. Beautiful things like internet connection sharing for private users. Things like allowing links. But the biggest is operating system-wide VBS support. And once you, you know, you can go ahead and remove your Windows scripting host. But I can guarantee you there's going, to be at le there's going to be at least three or four things in your registry that need that. Yeah, it's a slicker and more effective GUI. The only problem is, is that, well, you still have VBS support out worldwide. And unlike Windows 98 and NT, it's a lot harder to go through the registry and manually out edit out a lot of those keys. If any of you guys have wandered around the 2K registry, <laughs> You have to notice that uh, you try going into the SAM or the Hive keys. 
After a bloody week, I had to go through and individually set the security permissions. It wouldn't even let the administrator read them. Security through obscurity. And what I was looking here is that they secured the SAMs. Beautiful. They did not bother doing it for the applications. So anything under HKEY local machine slash Microsoft current version Windows and all the installed apps. You know, you're going to go app paths, all those things. They didn't add the extra security there. The only area you have to worry about when doing a regedit is using regedit 32 and having locked out and bastardized binary values that you can't touch without going through every single key and by hand undoing them. Now the structure of the secure keys, the secure and supposedly uneditable, they're only system ones. Where the SAMs and the usernames and logons are stored. I'll go into that in a second, but I want to reiterate the fact that it doesn't matter because if you've left sharing on and you've let NetBIOS and NetBuoy helper on, you can enumerate those with any cookbook script kitty tool in about maybe two minutes, three if you stop for a beer. I was looking through these keys and they had a very simple structure. Let's say you have usernames, administrator, guest, victim, whatever. You have these three name, you have these three named accounts. You unlock the keys, it'll say administrator, guest, victim, and you'll see that there's an entry with each of them blank. I was looking at this hive structure and right above them under a different key, under the HE SAMs, is the exact same number of keys as the number of accounts on the machine, where the simple garbage hash string is the names, and under those another seven and so on. Those keys are not really a target rich environment. Well, that and seven had time to play with them yet. But the biggest problem with this is that people think, because of all the new security features, Win2K is going to be locked down tight. People, you know, because it's faster and they've added all these new patches. Ooh, they put out SB6. I'm so excited. You know, for the good old 4.0. The only problem is, is how long has this been out? By definition, the people who have been training and going through your IT are now working in low-level monkey jobs and tech support or mostly your deployment team. Yeah, a lot of them are still just getting to play with 2K. If they're worth their salt, they know how to pirate an MSDN one. Oops, is that loud? But a lot of them are playing with 2K for the first time. And they see the new network neighborhood interface. They see all these different icons. They see a wonderful attempt by Microsoft to hide all the user settings. <laughs> And they haven't really gotten the full hang of how to customize it out. But everybody's going to rush into deploying 2K because, well, it's the cutting edge of technology. And Windows NT is no longer going to re release any service packs. Hmm. Funny coincidence. There's no more service packs for NT. 2K's out. And then all of a sudden, a great slew around the time they announce that there's, you know, we're not going to fix anything else, and new exploits come out for NT. Yeah, of course, you got panic caffeine ma managers who, you know, they know how to go ahead and hit up packet storm and oh my god, there's an unrelated exploit, but the word 2000 is in there, and the word, no, the word NT is in there, so let's go ahead and deploy it. Or you've got a lot of investors who don't like the ideas of servers running on old technology. Old equals reliable in some cases. Well, okay, I can't say Microsoft's reliable with a straight face. What I can say is that for God's sakes, if you're working in IT or deployment, do not let your bosses deploy 2K until, until all your techs have had a chance to play with it. Because they get so lost in the new GUI and the features, and once again, that really creative attempt to hide network neighborhood, that sucks. <laughs> I mean, that they haven't bothered to do the simple things. People overlook the basics. You know, the basic NT security, passwording the shares, nothing fully readable. And making sure it's all patched and updated. And, well, yeah, MS is no problem with this. I call it the pay no attention to the man behind the curtain theory. With all the new slick and shiny features and pretty icons, nobody's going to bother to go through and hit their basic chat list, go to cert. And because the, ne the structure of the icons for the network are separated, my network neighborhood, entire network, computers near me, which I think is a beautiful touch. If I'm, in, if I'm hacking somebody's box, I want to know all the computers near them. 
All these have managed to take the horrible mesh that most corporations' network neighborhood icons were and separate them into a couple of other unorganized mess. Much more effective that way. However, 2K does have a lot of good security features. And it's called the off switch. <laughs> and the biggest thing is, it is really, I will say this, it's got an, a slicker feel in the interface. And if you know how to use it and you've spent a couple of months going through and playing with every teeny feature and living nothing and breathing nothing but 2K, yeah, you'll be able to learn it fine. But if you're some tech who's sitting on IRC during his knock shift late night who's got to deploy these boxes and who's in the meantime mailing out his resumes and get another contract gig, the guy's not going to go through and do all the basics because the user settings are way too hard to find. And of course we have Win2K 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 and SQL. Win2K and SQL. All the old SQL exploits are still applicable. Plus a slew of new ones that, well, like I said last year, hacking. My, some hackers say they don't like Windows because hacking Microsoft is like mugging the retarded. I say mugging the retarded can be both fun and profitable. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and get back into the meat of it. Some of the new tricks and toys for it. People do not understand how to set up. A, they figure they got their 2K box and they're using VPN, which is one of the latest buzzwords. They figure that this is going to make them secure. They don't seem to understand that, yeah, even a firewall isn't enough. You've got a great big firewall laid out in front of your 2K servers. You've now got, you know, something that nobody, they haven't had any decent support on. Nobody's bothering to update the software patches because 2K is the bleeding edge. We're not going to put any money out for it because we've already paid for how many licenses for advanced server. And you've got VPN. Of course, you've got maybe 200 people in your global corporation VPNing in from their little 98 laptops with shared C drives. And they give a nice anonymous encrypted tunnel through the firewall. Can you see buggered.com? The way we exploit this is simple. Go ahead and run, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Rhino 9 tools, you can get them on Packet Storm. There's one of them called Legion. If, okay, hypothetically, if somebody were to download one of these things and let's say, give it an address range of one of your local cable modem providers, especially if you live in the Silicon Valley area, <laughs> sure enough, you're gonna find a lot of people's resumes, a lot of them in, say, security with their nice map C drives. And as you're reading through there, my documents, you might want to go ahead and take the time to grab the registry and the RNA keys. I'm sure all of you know, you know, remember the little program that allows you to dial up networking passwords from people's saved dial-in accounts that cracks those? For 10 bonus points, does anybody want to tell me what classic connection the VPN connection to dial-in is? <laughs> yep, it's dial-up networking and just as easily exploitable. So what you go ahead and do after you've given, us, given them a subscription to Nambla because you find a file called visa.rtf is you grab the keys and here comes another beautiful Microsoft feature. You have your VPN tunnel into the firewall. There's two ways to go about it here, attacking it from the 98 box. You can use internet connection sharing. Hey, I'm all about sharing if they left that enabled. If not, just go ahead and use, an, use your name and password information and I guarantee you 9 out of 10 of them are not set up to verify by IP. The system does not support that, you know, trusted host. So, you know, you're using their username and passwords and you're telecommuting in, you do a little work around that company. And sure enough, since they haven't bothered securing the domain model and it's got a big net buoy mesh there, you have all kinds of other wonderful things to go through. People think if they disable, you know, remote administration that, you know, and they don't use work groups, they figure they can just stick them all in the same mesh. Hmm, here's the web server in the same network neighborhood as the CEO's Windows 98 box. who has got John Q, script, John Q script kitty going through and going, hmm, where do I want to go today? <laughs> Yeah. 
here. Well, anyway, that is the easiest and most common way to harvest through in 2K. To harvest through in 2K. I'm going to go through a couple other of my favorite pet exploits, and I'm going to give you guys a little time for Q and A. Now, a lot of the holes here are Win 2K's, like I said, connection with Windows 98. They've made sure that the two can interface. And much like sex would be between two fat people, once they've made a connection and authenticated, you can't tell where one ends and the other begins. And it's all ugly. <laughs> and with the new Outlook bug bugs, which are going to take them forever to patch. Win2K, you know, Win2K does offer a lot of great security features, but like I was saying before, there's no way in hell, you know, your techs are going to go through and play with them all. Well, not on your guys' this time anyway, if you're hiring them, and get them all set up properly. So your best bet would actually probably be, I don't really endorse a lot of products, but I'd say CyberCop would be the best bet, because CyberCop keeps an up-to-date database of the net, net vulnerabilities. And failing that, if you're on a contract or a brand new job, it generates enough documentation to scare the hell out of your CEO and get him to do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, so CyberCop, it's basically, it's got your NT security checklist and it gives you a nice vulnerability database that's presentable so you don't have to do the typing. Okay, some of the oldies but goodies. Win2K still has a lot of vulnerabilities with readable. People don't seem to understand that when you share a drive or a folder, everything under that is readable. You got NTFS permissions set. That's fine and dandy. Well, after I've been raping the system by, <laughs> by enumerating a list of your usernames, passwords, shares, seeing who's got the blank guest account, I remember your domain. So I can just go ahead and copy those. NTFS, NTFS permissions are not a protection. They are false security. I mean, 98% of the exploits, well, before somebody, a lot of different people decided it was time to go after Microsoft Outlook, which my personal theory on that to digress is, has nothing to do with security and vulnerability. It has to do with a lot of us were sick of using that thing at the office and dialing in and waiting for 30 minutes for it to sync a folder. <laughs> but, um, went to case security especially when it comes to the 98 interface. The biggest problem is the connections are very highly un unauthenticated. Once it's in your network neighborhood, it's a member and it's a friend. And all you need is read access to any of those boxes or their MBT stables. For instance, you, may, you see somebody on IRC or whoever you, however you got the IP, ICQ, what have you. So you go ahead and do an MBT step minus A slash slash their IP. <clears throat> and you've got a list of their tables. First three common targets you always try, C dollar sign, admin dollar sign, and, oh, scare me, IPC first, then the others. Once you've mapped the IPC and it says completed successfully, go ahead and net use any of the others. For those of you who I'm going too fast for, um, net slash question mark, no, excuse me, net use slash question mark, cat it into a text file, read it, love it, and MBT stat, same thing. That'll give you a list of all the command line switches, ways to play with it. Now, a lot of people, they have problems hacking in MBT boxes because, well, they're Unix geeks and think that uh, the Windows interface is illogical. And yeah, it is. I don't want to have to hit start to shut the computer down. That hurts the mind. <laughs> but uh, the biggest problem on interfacing from the hacking side of it is, uh, a lot of you, especially, let's say you're going through your company network and you've got a legitimate reason to access a folder, like your boss's porn. And uh, <laughs> you try to connect to it. Excuse me, I meant the file server and shared resources. You've got to connect to it. And it says connect as, ask for a password. Well, the 98 box doesn't do that. Why isn't mine working? A, because your IT department's incompetent. B, because you don't know how to map it. A lot of the times, they'll leave a blank password. There's a difference between user and shared level. Shares. They both have the pros and cons. But I'd recommend going for a per-user authentication. 
and one of the best ways to make sure this means that using per per user you have a list of trusted hosts so nobody's coming in and playing silly buggers remotely well not that easily anyway it should you should at least in my opinion for it not to be an easy hack not be able to finish your beer before you've got all the company information just my opinion but user and share level and 98 you know most of it's stock share level meaning they didn't bother connecting as who well within t when you have 2k and NT boxes on the same network as a lot of 98 laptops a lot of people won't bother with the logon scripts and such and they want to leave them easily connectable for people who don't have opposable thumbs and need to use 98 SE to connect and can't figure out hmm domain name slash username what they do is they just leave it blank so you have connect as so go ahead and use username and enter no password and I can guarantee you nine times out of ten it'll work because people don't bother getting the interface right on them when they have the 98 boxes coming in you also have things like my you know the syncing for Outlook if any of you have ever tried to sync into an Outlook domain for the first time after getting a new job <laughs> I can guarantee you, you'll be missing hair and very frustrated and yelling and screaming obscenities and whatever your natural language is at the IT guy until you've got it right. Because it's, there you have username, password, domain to deal with. And half the time you get people running a 10-1 network still using their company's startup name, has a domain name, maybe a DMZ there, and the external name is maybe their new name, whatever.com. So it's a big tangled mess. Most people figure the best way to deal with this big tangled mess, even I've seen competent security people do it, is hell. Let's just make shortcuts everywhere with <laughs> and leave it blank. You cannot do this. The best m way I'd recommend getting around this problem would be, well, first of all, if you separate it into work groups, set the permissions properly on work groups. A big mesh is unacceptable. From a security point of view, let's say you're not even worrying about an intruder. How many of you have ever tried to find, let's say, a copy of Netscape or whatever you need in your corporate network, and you don't know the backups? So you go surfing through every single one of those. How much time is that costing your company? As a, or let's say you've got a project, and you've got to search one of your coworkers' drives for everything. How much time is that costing your company? The insecure mesh domain topology, the biggest problem with that is, yeah, let's say, I hack your site. I make a, I make the you know just horrible fun of you on the news. Something I'm seeing on your web page. Decent PR. You're going to get around that. How much time is lost looking for the files? Where if they just had one single file server, they wouldn't bother with it. If they couldn't find it there, they know it's gone. Think of how, how much man hours, company wide and nationwide, are wasted on that. It's one of my happy pet peeves. But the, one of the biggest part of security is usability. And people seem to forget that. That's one of my biggest no scores on Win2K. The usability is very low when it comes to usability over security. With good old NT, all you had to do was point at some of Mudge's work, scare the hell out of your bosses, and yell at your IT guys till they learn how to write a log on script. With good with the brand new Win2K, it gets to the point where if you're a tech who's got to slap out 50 production servers and God knows whatever else your developers and marketing geeks in the pink alligator shirts want. You don't have time to go through and play with all these individual settings and because some of the creative disasters I've seen people using their network topology to try to work around 2K, you know, they don't got the time to make a secure image or there isn't one secure image that'll work around because they haven't bothered investigating and checking out the user and shared passwords and networking. I'm going to go ahead and go into a little QA and then we'll go with a couple of tasty exploits I'm saving for last. Mm -hmm. In the green shirt in the front. Okay, ports uh, 135, 139 block. Yeah. Define blocked. Define blocked. Or what's the traffic deny? Is it deny any any? Deny any inbound? Block 139? Yeah. Uh, any okay. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. We, first, you can get a list of the shares. Um, Hobbit and the Rhino 9 guys, they wrote a really nice net void doc. It'll have, you'll see a list of names, net codes, and such. And it'll have the list of all the services. You go ahead and decode those. And you look at the table. The next thing you do, okay. One of my favorite things for hacking 2K boxes or any network stuff, look at the computer name first. I think I believe it's like 03 is in parentheses before it, the new ones. If you see OEM workgroup or compact one, a preferred customer, your job is going to be very easy. <laughs> But so once you've enumerated the shares, the other thing you can do is run a SID dump. You know, S2SID. And you'll have a list of landman, landman passwords, how long ago they were changed, expired. When fingerprint will do that for you, once you made the IPC connection. You can also do a net view. But how do you make the IPC connection? Well, what, if you have Good question. The first thing, one for it, huh? Correct. You go through 445, but I prefer an easier method. What you do is, you, at that point, you go ahead and use the right vulnerability and just get the tables that way. Overwrite, you know, plant a Trojan in there, like good old back orifice, and get it out. But when you, once you've got the information, it's a big profiling hole. If you've, if you've managed a map IPC, you are now a member of the workgroup. So go surfing through and explore, and you'll find something open to make another connection through. Okay. What I don't understand is with, with uh, so how, how do you use 435? Yeah. Block? It'll go out through it, yes. Okay, and then with, with 135, 139, and 445? Block. With all of those blocked at the firewall, what you're going to have to do is go ahead and switch attack methods, but you can still get a lot of useful information like user list, things like that from it. Oh, okay. Don't put, it's called separating your networks. You can also filter. You know, heavy pole filtering is going to make no usability. My personal method is I prefer a decent topology where you keep the networks off. You separate them into work groups. So let's say, yeah, they get your marketing geeks. Who cares? You keep your production servers separate. You can also use like a nuke net. You can use the nuke never and set it to look for a certain or a packet filter or an IDS and set it to look for a certain series coming in. You know, you stiff the packets record. If there's anything that looks even vaguely like an MBT stat, it tells it to bugger off. go through and lock down an NT box, the first thing I do is go, <laughs> how was that? Oh. The first thing I do is go ahead, I have a very simple system, I don't go through the standard cert list and your standard security list, I go registry level first, use SMS to distribute, uh, who is it? There's, there is already a very nice uh, NT reg patch that's written. First you lock down that way, then you install your IDS. I don't, I don't like Tripwire that much. It's not because, you know, I have any faults with the product. I just haven't had the time to play with it that much. And I prefer go ahead and hit up Packet Storm once again. If you're going to use, I use a combination of Viper DB for file and uh, Real Secure for warnings. Real Secure isn't that very good when it comes to dealing with it. It'll give you a lot of false alarms. It comes to file modification, port traffic like that. But once you get it down, it can be a very good little reporting tool, and it's a better whistleblower. And Viper DB is a damn good IDS, but it doesn't have a slick interface, so I use the hybrid of those two as a preference for my home systems. Did you want to know, like, production things, if I was going to do it differently for outside? There is a list of reg patches on my website, actually. 
that will have this for you. I use a custom set. Uh, www.dis.org forward slash Mr. Mojo. M-R-M-O-J-O. -O, no caps. And in the hacking section, if I manage to make it back to my computer in time, I'll go and double check that it's slammed up on the servers. It'll be called ntregpatch.zip. There'll be a link to it. And that's something, that's most of my standard favorites. You see, the problem with using a stock customized wedge patch, though, is you've got a big production server that's got, you know, who knows what, let's say it wants to use Outlook syncing in some things. If you turn off too much stuff or you want well, maybe good for one person, isn't going to be always good for everybody else. You have to go through and read the REM statements and make sure you don't break stuff and have the IT department want your head. Okay, for, for the domain model, I like to keep it sweet and simple. I always keep my production, you know, I always want to keep the production servers in, in their own DMZ. You keep the work group set up. It's going to cause a little communication problems, but in my opinion, developers should not be talking to the same machine. They shouldn't have redundant connections. So what you do is go ahead and lay out your work groups. Then you have an administrator in each group who has limited access to do modifications and manage them. If you don't have the personnel, just keep a tighter rein on it yourself. So you have your work group set out, your production and your internal net should be not on the same servers though, as well as any developer who needs to have outside net access, stick him the hell outside the firewall and make sure he's not VPNing or using any kind of remote management. Was that what you wanted? Get next. You said that there wasn't uh, too much point in having the NTFS security set. Hypothetically, you're in the network. Oh, hold on. I said that NT. I didn't say there wasn't a point to it, but alone it is not an invaluable tool. There, it is a very needed thing. It's one of the basic things on your checklist. read access to user and system and recreate the registry from the raw files. You said everyone, everyone, right? Everyone at the share level with the file. Mm. Well, you can still read it or copy it. I have a lot of Trojans and programs and papers and such on how to sneak around NTFS. And what it comes down to though is if you have these vulnerable things readable, there is no way to secure, let's say you go into their program files, you just keep switching targets off. You find the account names on different parts of the system, or you use good old wind fingerprint. I can't remember what it's originally called, which will give you a list of accounts and you can brute force them at that point. So here's the part where I see which one of the people who make these systems here bought me the most beer. No. <laughs> oh, what I prefer is that you don't use VPN. Let's say you're doing, you have a whole bunch of boxes coloed. I actually PC anywhere on a high encryption level. That's a really good remote networking situation. A, it runs as an NT service. And you can set it up so when, this isn't just from a security standpoint, it's from standpoint of usability. You don't want to have to fly to Taipei or you know some godforsaken place to yell at somebody in a foreign cola to restart it when you reboot the server. And it's really simple. You're not looking through somebody else's slick interface remote networking. Now I use like open source or site source, you know, view files for monitoring and PC anywhere so you're actually at the box. You never trust anything a Windows box says it's being done remotely unless you can see the screen in front of you.
Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, a lot of the, the biggest missing, I'll go for the simple level first, and I'll take it a little out, it's a multi-parted question there. Okay. Uh, prime example, the first time um, is you get the tables past that. If you don't have one outbound as well as inbound packets denied, once you make the request, it comes in through 80. You know, your local network sees at 139, sends it back out 80. That's how you get the tables. And go ahead and you can get, you know, S2, SID dumps, all the other wonderful Windows hacking tools, which will give you the accounts list. Passwords, it'll tell you blank passwords. Once you get a blank password or a, blank, or a weak guest account or something you feel is just way too easy to brute force, then you go ahead and make the connection that way through an authenticated manner. Okay, you're denying the 135, 137. If you're allowing them out, or the lose, they'll send those outbound through those ports once you made the request via N80. Maybe it wasn't clear. biggest reason it kind of slipped me there um, the main problem I have with installing Win2K over NT as well remember Loftcrack remember what I was saying about secured keys Loftcrack I don't know if they've upgraded it the SMB stuff will still work but when I first played with Loftcrack and 2K a few months ago it choked unless if you'd installed it over a good old 2K system and guess what it would crack the locals because those files are still there Anybody else interesting in skipping should be near the pool. Um, was there any other questions in the meantime? Oh. Well, don't, oh, on your servers, yeah. Any IT boss that says you're doing all the desktop to 2000, he's incompetent, just shoot him. you're looking at is for a more secure connection it'll show it yeah okay raise a good point out now when you have worried about exploits like that the, the best thing you can do you're not going to like it we're only getting the questions out we're not getting the questions out of Def Con TV can you repeat the questions before you answer them that's what we ask okay no problem um when you're saying about if you're in a situation where you have to go ahead and make a secure connection for a whole bunch of 2K laptops. I feel your pain. And that's secure and safe. Your best bet would your best bet would be sure that you lock down all the NTFS, give them nuke nabbers, 
you know, to block the 135, 139. Make sure you've got a very, your best protection in that case is security policy. Hey, okay, writing them, but they're wonderful. You make sure you've got a secure image, which are available on it for, you can probably find those by manufacturers or there's other places. I think cert.org has resources on where to find those. Go ahead and slap a secure image on, and your best, your best protection in that case would be informing them. Informing your users, send a memo. Don't get too technical. Say if you do this, 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 and this, Michael thinks you should have been writing down or at least recording, <laughs> you're going to get us hacked. So, inf so informing them and making sure they're secure, that's your best bet. Maybe adding a port blocker. Oh, yeah. So when you've got a separate organization, you've got separate parts of your organization. Yeah, lots of collocations, and you can't you can't definitely deploy it to all those 500, and you've got an unmanageable firewall. Well, the first thing for the unmanageable firewall is you take firewall one off the box, and you install it pegs. And the next thing you do is do not use VPN dial-up connections. Like I said, policy is your best protection. They should not be tunneling in, no matter how secure you think those boxes are. And that's your best mean-time protection. If you've got anybody who's got home connections, which is kind of like the laptops that go into the firewall, you know, open this. Uh, could I open one thing that can have IDENT for my MIRC? You know, everybody. You got home connections? Slap a firewall on them. Well, the, your best protection is a UIT or security. All right, so do you do IT or security? Oh, in that case, the policy is the hand of God there. Just tighten up the rules a little. And once you have, this, once you have it running smoothly, it should be okay, and people will find that it's more usable as a secure model. Ninety day free CD. Oh wait, wait, what do I call that? Oh, that's coaster. That's what those are. <laughs> no, I don't. You can use it as a coaster, a frisbee, jewelry. At the uh, recent Microsoft Developers Conference, they announced the SOAP protocol, everything at Rage CTP, on a scale of one to ten. How uh, harmful is that ten being? Buggered. I'm not going to go into that. There's all well, research being done that late. Yeah, you don't get quite the new stuff till I finished it and polished it out. Like I said, once again, hit the website in a bit, but I think it sucks. And it's very dangerous. Oh, sorry. Repeat the question. You were asking about SOAP amounts to the Microsoft Developers Conference. Like I said, I haven't had a chance to go through and play with it. But from a security point of view, it looks like a really bad idea. <laughs> It's just thinking the same. But what you do in that case, um, when you're training your new administrators, there's well, you have cert.org, which is a lot of good security and policy stuff. You have an automated hacking site if you search through, you know, just search for InfoSeq, like the one for you, the contents of your CDRA and such. But your best bet is to sit them down in front of a box and show them. The only way they're going to have the fear of God done into it, okay, you get a hub out. I've done this myself. I was having an argument. I had a contract I once took with a guy who said he wanted to leave everything printable. He wanted to leave all the shares and the resources readable. There's no reason because we have NTFS. 
And we went on for days about this, and finally we scheduled another meeting. And about the time I walked into the meeting, the scheduled job I'd planted on his, on his home laptop the night before, went ahead and printed out a 20-page document on that biosecurity, right, as he's about to talk to a boss. That does it. Use the fear of God tactics. You've got to demonstrate it on a close personal level. I'm not really going to go into Active Directory because it's a whole new can of worms. Your best bet would be checking uh, Access did a speech on that. Go ahead and check the archives on that. Because I go off for hours on that one. Your best bet is keep it simple and old-fashioned. If you don't know how the application works, or you don't know every single bit of it, don't do it. We're going to do it for cost-effectiveness. box. Don't ever do it. <laughs> yeah. There is an entire slew of holes in the upgrade. I didn't realize I didn't catch that one. He's spent my time with the documents. <laughs> I'll go ahead and I'll spew out this, uh, your security resources right, resources right now. Go ahead and hit uh, botspot.com, get one of those little programs that checks all these websites for you and drops you a mail with the latest stuff. One of my personal favorites is packetstorm.securify.com. Um, go to you guys, securityfocus.org, or no, com now, securityfocus.com. Those are usually the quickest in getting the new exploits. You also see a lot of the stuff that's kind of a hybrid of both. This is me and my missed on the Hackers News Network. Uh, my site also. When I get the time to get off my button, stop speaking conventions, getting exploits out. My site? My site, again, is www.dis.org forward slash Mr. Mojo. All in lowercase. Once you've got the only way I deal with SMS, once I've got the registry patches deployed, it gets turned off. I'm not, I don't really go into that much. I use it when I've got to deploy reg patches on somebody's unsecure system. Also, another good list of security resources and making sure it's locked down, though, in SMS, SMS vulnerabilities, CyberCop. Go ahead and use CyberCop and supplement it with, implement, you know, with input from the latest websites. see any hands out there? Am I missing anybody? IPSEC is a very good thing, but never depend solely on one source of security. Oh, I almost forgot. A really simple problem, you were mentioning Win2K Pro, that piece of uh, technology, <laughs> that uh, you get a lot of IT departments, they forget that when they deploy server or advanced server, because they figure it's going to be faster or whatever, they forget to turn off bloody IIS. So you've got all your laptops wearing, you know, advertising a web server, and an unpatched and unprotected one at that. Well, I think that's about the gist of it today.